try and get everybody settled and then we'll, we'll start the evening. Uh, good evening. Uh, for those who uh, don't know, I'm, I'm Nate Lau. I'm the Dean of the School of Humanities and Fine Arts. And I want to thank you for joining us tonight to uh, celebrate the many achievements of our colleague and friend, Carl Elder. Uh, after this short program uh, and Carl's reading, he's going to read some, some poems, I believe. Here in the, the gallery, I'd like to invite everyone over to the 1862 Lounge uh, for a reception with some food, cake, drinks, uh, conversation, and to view a sort of retrospective. You know about that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, reception will run until about 8 o'clock. I, I hope you can, you can join us over there. I, I'd like to thank a few people for helping me organize this thing and plan for it and set it up. Uh, Jody Litke, uh, Charlie Krebs, and Chris Wiley, Robin Mock, Emily Shartner, uh, and dining services, especially Caroline and Sierra uh, over in the lounge. So I'm honored to be here in my role to recognize Carl for the significant influence he's had on publishing, not only his own, but countless hundreds of others' work, teaching the creative process, and mentoring aspiring writers and publishers and editors and so on in the field of creative writing. I've gleaned from my many conversations with Carl that publishing, teaching, and mentoring are equal and inseparable, inseparable parts of his life as a writer. And it's his tireless and passionate dedication to these pursuits that is being honored tonight. No doubt the mentorship he has given me already in our 10 years of knowing each other will significantly impact, uh, will significantly impact and last the rest of my life. The Fine Arts Gallery of Distinction is curated and carried forward in Lakeland's tradition, not by the administration, but by the faculty of the Fine Arts programs. Both the nomination and the approval come from the faculty, and the qualities of worthy candidates are easy to describe but take a career to achieve. A long devoted tenure at Lakeland, acting out purposefully and intentionally the institution's educational mission, and enhancing the role the arts and arts programs play on and off our campus community. Now we get to add to Carl's list significant contribution to one's field of artistry, both statewide and nationally. This distinction is neither annually nor regular, regularly bestowed. This is only for special cases, and since all of you know Carl very well, you will agree that he is nothing less than a special case. <laughs> More on that, I suspect, from the students tonight and in conversation over drinks later. Uh, I'm going to leave room for stories from the next speakers, but uh, as dean, I think it's fitting for me to draw some scope around the vast success and valuable experience that Carl has brought to our campus and nearly four decades of Lakeland students. Here's a few accomplishments by the numbers. 50 issues of seams. I've got it here. This is number 50. This is the National Literary Journal that Carl and dozens upon dozens of student interns have independently published going back to 1978. Nearly 40 nationally recognized writers have come to participate in the Great Lakes Writers Festival at Carl's invitation since 1991. Among the many accolades of these writers, MacArthur Genius Grant Fellow, the Pulitzer Prize, Wisconsin Poet Laureate, too, I think, right? And U.S. Poet Laureate. 38 years of teaching, including one Lakeland Outstanding Teacher Award, nine <coughs> collections of poetry, the most recent of those, Gilgamesh at the Bellagio from 2007, half a dozen writing awards, including the Chad Walsh Award for Poetry from the Belo Beloit Poetry Journal, and two from the Council for Wisconsin Writers, the Lorian Nidecker Award for a book or group of poems, and the Christopher Latham Scholes Award for Outstanding Encouragement of Wisconsin Writers. Two degrees for Lakeland, he has he's been instrumental in forming the Bachelor of Arts in Writing, which at the time was unique in the state, 
and this is the inaugural year of the only Bachelor of Fine Arts in Creative Writing in the state of Wisconsin. Two of Carl's poems have been reprinted and anthologized in the prestigious Best American Poetry series. One Pushcart Prize, as well as another eight, I think, nominations for this highly coveted recognition by the nation's literary journals. Fourteen. Fourteen, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I've been in the sorry. <laughs> You're not counting. Uh, most recently is Novel, uh, published last year, but I think written in the 80s, Earth As It Is in Heaven, and it should be noted was published by Pebblebrook Press, which was created by and is thriving in no small part because of two Lakeland writing alum. And last but not least of which are the uncountable journal, anthology, blog, and website publications, and reprints of Carl's poems, essays, stories, interviews, reviews, and book blurbs. Clearly tonight is deserving recognition and we at Lakeland are lucky to, have, lucky to have benefited from Carl's teaching and writing life for these 38 years and counting, I assume. Carl, thank you and congratulations. <laughs> we have more people who are gonna speak, so I'd like to introduce uh, those individuals first. I'm proud to bring Carolee Manis and Danielle Livingston to the podium, two writing majors who will be graduating this May, and both worked with Carl on their senior projects in poetry, among many, many other projects with Carl and for the writing program. After them, uh, Jeff Alzinga, professor of writing and Carl's colleague in the writing program for 37 years, will say a few <coughs> words and present Carl with his plaque of recognition. So Carolee and Danielle, please come on. suggested that the human race shares an unconscious, a collective unconscious where our, wherein archetypes are held. An archetype is a universal symbol that everyone knows detail about. Carl Elder is his own archetype. Everyone knows that Carl is a tweed jacket with patched elbows, a bottle of Kinnikinnick, a tub of lifesaver mints, a tobacco pipe, and a can of Diet Sierra Mist. But he is also a man of many layers. Uh, similar to the state of his office. <laughs> Anyone who knows Carl has at some point been made to gaze upon the Anne Sexton poster in his office or listen to his random stories. But even though some of these may be done without knowing the original purpose, you come to find that Carl always has an intention in mind. But you will also know that being around Carl comes with a lot of laughs and amusements. You will inevitably explain to him the finer points of current pop culture. Find yourself playing a year and a half long game of trying to figure out just how many copies of Native Son he actually has in his office. It's five, not six, by the way. It's six. Decide, <laughs> decide to create your own matrim class, or plan a trip to DC and tell him to approve it in a way that makes it sound like you're asking him for permission, and he does it. Knowing Carl also means you can count on him to introduce you in the same, in the same, with the same piece of information every time you must read for an event to which he has dragged you along. This particular bit of information he learned about and mentioned to me in an email before we even met. The fact that I live in the next town over from one of his sons. He did not break this two and a half year long streak until the past, this past Great Lakes Writers Festival when he instead gave me a lovely new nickname, the Conso of <laughs> Carl is a very caring man. I've only missed one of his classes once on accident. He called me with a slight panic in his voice and asked if I was okay and if I needed help. Surely I did. I had taken NyQuil for the first time last night and was in a near coma. Sheepishly, I admitted to Carl that I had just slept through his class. And he said, oh, good. <laughs> In all his amusing uniqueness, Carl is also a very generous man who is extraordinarily giving of his time. Both of us decided to write our senior projects over the summer, and Carl helped us throughout those months. Not just by email, of which we set deadlines every two weeks, but he also met with us in person to work with, work with us on our poems. 
During this time, as is often in the case with his classes, he never flat out, told, flat out said no to any of our work. He is also helpful in his critiques. Plus, as some of you can attest, how awesome is it when Carl approves one of your poems? <laughs> <laughs> a Carl class is not necessarily an easy class, but you get lifelong skills that you'll always use and remember. He also gives students opportunities most undergraduates aren't usually afforded, as with the Seams and Great Lakes Writers Festival internships we've both been fortunate enough to have experience, which, which have also made us better equipped, equipped to professionals as the tasks we've taken on have pushed us out of our comfort zones and shown us that we can accomplish more than we previously thought. The way of doing this is beneficial as well, in that he doesn't simply tell you what to do, he makes you figure it out and problem solve. Despite all the hard work and hours put in, Carl seems to find a whole lot of enjoyment in his work. He seems to take great pleasure in taking students on odd field trips from old Maine to Iraq to look at the hole in the wall as a poetry exercise or in toying with his writing assistants over the state of his office. Psychological studies have shown play fosters creativity. Carl preaches and practices this belief. Just as children do, Carl indulges in play in every task he is performing. This not only leads to a sense of happiness, but also a prolific creativity. Carl is a man of play, passions, and poetry. We wouldn't have him any other way. is to hand this award to Carl and uh, eventually it will be placed right here with the others. But I'm also given the opportunity to say just a few things while I'm up here and I'm going to do that. Carl came to Lakeland in 1979. I came in 1980. So we've, been, we've known each other and been friends for more than 35 years. One reason I enjoy coming to work every day, one of the big reasons, is because I know I'm going to be able to talk with Carl. And usually it's several times during the day. So what do we talk about? Well, we might share concerns over a student who's in trouble, needs some extra help, um, needs a kick in the butt, which Carl is good at. <laughs> We might talk about Lakeland business. There's always a lot of Lakeland business to talk about. Uh, sometimes we'll talk about a movie we've seen or maybe a poem we've read in The New Yorker. Uh, sometimes we just uh, make fun of Dr. Kodabandi. <laughs> <laughs> but all of those are moments I cherish. And it's one of the reasons Carl is one of the reasons, one of the main reasons I stayed at Lakeland. And I think this is as good a time as any for me to publicly thank Carl for my being at Lakeland and for my getting to live the life that I've had here. When Lakeland was thinking of hiring me back in 1980, I know that Carl was the person who uh, argued most persuasively that I was someone to be hired. And because of that, and my coming here, radically changed the direction of my life. And it was a good change, and I'm really glad for it. So thank you, Carl. Not long ago, Valerie and I uh, were at Chester's Drive-In in Plymouth. And I ran into a woman who was a student here 25 years ago. And she comes up to me and she says, is Professor Elder still there? Mm -hmm. And I said, he is. Mm -hmm. And she looked at me with this kind of strange smile. <laughs> and it, and it, the smile had changed. At first it was kind of a victorious smile that she had remembered, I made it through his reading workshop class. <laughs> and 
you know, I feel so much better for it. But then the smile kind of changed and the corner of her mouth twisted a little bit and I don't know if she was biting her lip and all I could think was that she was thinking about that scene from Jaws when the shark leaps out of the water and bites the boat in half. But then she said to me, wow, Mr. Elder, you was something else. Well, she's right. Carl is something else. Something else. Which brings me to my final point. We're here to honor Carl for his creative talents, for the many things he's written and published, and the students he's taught uh, in poetry, advanced composition, senior project, all of these writing, creative writing classes. But we're missing a really, really large, a larger part of what he does for Lakeland and our students. And frankly, it's something that all of us take for granted. In 35 years, more than 35 years here, Carl has seen, I think, about 150, maybe as many, two, as, many as 200 writing majors graduate. And that's a, a significant number. In that same time, he's taught over 3,000 students how to read and how to study in college. Many of those students were at-risk students and they never graduated from Lakeland. But many, many of them did. And in large part, they can attribute their success to how Carl taught them to read, read for comprehension, increase their vocabulary, read for speed, read for main idea, summarize. Basically, he told them how to think. If Carl gave his intellect and his imagination to <clears throat> his creative writing students, his reading students got his heart and his soul. I know that's not why we're here tonight, but since I had the opportunity, I think it was something that needed to be said. <laughs> it's great to see Brenda here to share in this night, and also Seth and Wade and their families to be part of this honor. Now we've heard from Nate about Carl's many creative accomplishments, which are enormous. We've heard from Carolee and Danielle about what it's like to have Carl as a teacher and a mentor. In a few minutes, Carl's going to read some of his work, but I think now's the time for him to come up here and officially accept this honor that is coming from his friends, his colleagues, and his students. So, this is what it looks like. Yeah, they were both 
Eagle Scouts, big deal. <laughs> they were Eagle Scouts, they knew they had to be Eagle Scouts, they wouldn't have gotten a damn driver's license. <laughs> <laughs> boy, did they marry well. <laughs> this is Nancy. tried to uh, imagine what it is that was going on here. I wasn't quite sure. In fact, I didn't know what was going on at all, except that Nate pulled me aside one day and he said, uh, we talked about this on it, and I had no idea what it was going to mean to me because, I don't know, I just don't think about things like that. But time passed, and, and then I began to realize, you know, your colleagues are the ones that made that gesture. And it became more and more important to me. Because we have a great, great relationship. I think of this place as a kind of fraternity. And we work hard with our students, and we love them. Usually. There's a few I'd like to send back to wherever. Um, but I tell you, I, I kept saying to myself, what am I going to say first? And, uh, and I didn't know until a little while ago, and I thought to myself, God, I hope my funeral is this much fun. You know? Um, I wish, I wish Lou could be here with Jerry. Um, Bill is sick. You guys have heard about that. He's gone through a couple of surgeries. Bill White and of course Denise can't be here tonight because she's tending Bill, which is quite a job, I'm sure. <laughs> Um, uh, Brenda, would you stand, please? <laughs> this is Brenda. <laughs> I started writing poems at the age of 21. She did not know she was marrying a poet. Neither did I. <laughs> well, she had a couple of requests. Brenda had a couple of requests, and I'm going to read them. And the first one is a poem that's inspired by a relation or a, a, a moment, uh, well, a few moments with uh, Seth, when Seth was about three years old. The piece is called Firebuck. One antler purple and orange flames, the other yellow, sheathed in soft blue at the base. This I confirm with my son, straddling my knee, authority in these matters, since I'm a bit blind to color. At three, he thinks nothing of it, my only favor. I love the red in his hair, like the late afternoon sun in his mother's, I think, turning back to the fire. And his memory makes magicians of us all. I conjure again this animal, its rack refueled by another log I blame. Now the flames flap like wet shirt tails in the wind. And I who ride am for a moment myself, the child content with the man he became. <laughs> the 
second piece I'm going to read is a result of an experience with weight. It was called the cockroach. <laughs> Not tall enough to use the urinal and union station, my youngest settles on the third <coughs> stall he inspects, relatively clean until something he's not seen in his life chases him out. A cockroach to rival any I've met. Mean as a mongoose, I remember saying once in the Far East, so that Wade's shout won't scare him off, though shrill enough to stifle the snores behind the door of the next stall over. <laughs> Later, of course, there are questions. Like, why don't they mop the vomit? And why was that man sleeping in there? So I tell him. And now, a week later, I want to take it back. Not that I lied or even told the truth. But as I watch him boldly swim for the first time just beneath the surface, as if to defy the net, his even bluer eyes open underwater, searching for my hands. And as I lift him slick, sputtering, wide-eyed, and for the moment bald, I look into his face, that Tweety Bird face absent its coyness. Wade, what we saw that time on vacation when we got off the train, I wish it were not real life. Just somebody's art with a capital A. But that's not what I mean. What's important is I stamp my foot. The cockroach vanished. You, you went in there and you went. And that man, why, when we didn't see so much as his face, did I make him out so low as to have a cockroach for a pet? As if a man who swims could not possibly drown. Let this be a lesson. I was the one not afraid, who now am. <coughs> we used to play, <coughs> Seth and Wade and I, in the backyard, 432 Madison Avenue. And we played in the sandbox. Well, it wasn't a box, was it? Big old tar, big old tractor tire. This is a piece called Immersing a Sand-Coated Hand in Water. It's uh, dedicated to Dave Lauer. I think it surfaced as a result of a conversation that Dave and I had about our kids and about work. And I thank Dave for the poem. Done with all that fuss at the office, here with the kids, back of the house, <coughs> kneeling before a bucket by a big old tire, a glove of grit to the wrist. How could anyone earn this moment, like swirls of flesh unfurling, as soon as my hand is under? how it would have to look, feel, entering the afterlife, the spirit smoldering, quenched. Here they come, Christina. Okay. Christine, okay. Uh, these are called demarcations. The hyphen. Had you a whole line of them, you'd have your own train. Imagine the freight. The colon. 
eyes of a dead man lying on his side, looking into a bright light. The comma. Ah, giant embryo with tail, what say you, yin or yang, you little shrimp? <laughs> the semicolon. A Spanish peanut, a cashew, which is the best fit for the appendix? The question mark. Eerie character, he whose lobe of an artist's left ear is severed. <laughs> the exclamation point, dadit, a signal in Morse code turned on end. N, you must solve for it. The period. How we've come to draw with such sheer economy the perfect circle. Mm -hmm. Okay, now it's going to get a little abstract. <laughs> um, <coughs> oh, and I don't think you know about this. But, huh? Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but when you were born, I was inspired to write a poem. You recall, of course, we probably still do this, don't we? Well, sometimes we call you O. Yeah. Sometimes we oh, call wow. you O. Yeah, what? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The poem is called Ode in the Key of O. You, you, you gotta be with me here, Wyatt, okay? Okay, you gotta listen very carefully. Kudos unto the code and to the mind behind the hand that moved not out of need, but what must be acknowledged as a thought non pareil stone turned wheel, no exception. The crude scrawl in ashes, sand, and soil with stick or staff, that which it did not know to call symbol, yet would bring to recall the awe uttered as O oh, on the rounded mouth below the eyes of one fixed upon the moon's shape, if not in worship, wonder. Yea, as if a remnant of God's gone ghost gleaned from the air by the hand of a mime, like approximation of perfection, that diminutive orb wholly without substance rolled from the tongue, made corporal by yet another eidolon, the line. Call it divine insight when the pupil of the mind's eye eclipses iris to highlight through swift abstraction the concrete. Ought it then not be after the grand span of 500 generations, given the cuneiform-like illusion of form born of the fact of annularity, our alacrity to the degree it has not atrophied to hilarity at the writ of the clock is, while more minute each minute, worthy too of praise. For value in its purest form is less a matter of matter than the marriage of light and shade, their interdependency in the sense, say, male and female were one from the beginning. No little arrow on the O of that embryo, no foe, target, cross, or stick man atlas below. Lo, behold, lift like Saul's soul, O from God. There's no GD or even dad gum thing to which we cling, if not a la lingua franca, more so than the thing itself. 
life. Buoy or lasso. Ah, oh, the ineffable grasp as we're pulled, gasping through H2O. <laughs> Thus, as it said, at the apogee of one's gestation, there is the crowning, there is as well the splash, and there is the circle of attendance, the cry, the swaddling, the mother's embrace, infant to her breast. Yet life is birth twist. In time, time doesn't exist. Birth flanked by nothing of the past. No word of the future when, alas, loves are Rizimo's most fierce in fear of life's loss. Oh, of the holes in the whole of our knowledge, we say miracle, though miracle, mother of miracles, is that we say it. As for love spell, phallic L, mellow O, vis-a-vis -vis Eve's cleft versus V snake eye E, is it not all to which we owe our all? <coughs> okay, the next piece is a world premiere. And it's going to be available in broadside form, thanks to a gorgeous bit of, uh, what do we call it, <coughs> design magic by Monique Brickman. And I want you all, please, to take a broadside home. They're going to be over in the 1862 Lounge. They're gorgeous, thanks to Monique. The piece is called The Baffle. Now, I'm going to try to explain this. Why? Why? You know that bird feeder we got outside, right outside the window there, right? You know it looks kind of like a house on top, uh-huh. But there's that long thing that's underneath. You know that round thing that looks like a cylinder, uh-huh. You know what I'm talking about, right? Uh -huh. That's the baffle, the cylinder. Uh -huh. The baffle. Feeder trays, husks flutter and off from fly like the sparrows, those flippity gibbets that, quickened by snow and cold, arrive in droves, while sporadically below, tail a rippling question mark, a squirrel forages, seeing not, apparently, beyond reflection in the window of the human, in whom there is no pleading. No nose in the air, no mock prayer before this temple atop a pole, shimmering, then still, then another chill, this winter of seemingly eternal external intervals. As the bottom of the stovepipe baffle, the very edge of its tunnel funnels the wind, rim whipped in circles a wobbling washing machine drum and spin cycle at first, but more like at last, hoop on the hips of a spry as a spastic spirit sprite. about was <clears throat> uh, 
securing the set list at a rock concert. And it happened to me. It happened to me. Uh, Joe Bonmas's <coughs> organ player, I can't remember the dude's name, but he ran right at me. Right at me. I was in the first row with Brenda. And uh, I got that set list. And I've often fantasized about, you know, being a rock and roll guitarist. I got an older son here who uh, took up the guitar just not too long ago, as a matter of fact. It's in the jeans, I guess. Um, but because, because I didn't have yet, Wyatt, I didn't have yet a poem in which you appeared. Uh -huh. I'm going to give you the set list. How's that? That's your souvenir. <laughs> and now I'm going to read one for my colleagues. This is the last one. It's not mine. It's a piece by Mark Strand. I'm reading it not only for my colleagues, but the innumerable students who, over the years at Lakeland, have told me this is a poem that moved them big time. It's Mark Strand. The poem is called Keeping Things Whole, and I hope you'll think of it as a transition for us to get old to the to society. I just have a feeling there's a little bit of burden over there. <laughs> Keeping things whole. In a field, I am the absence of field. This is always the case. Wherever I am, I am what is missing. When I walk, I part the air, and always the air moves in to fill the spaces where my body's been. We all have reasons for moving. I move to keep things whole. Thank you for coming. Mm -hmm.